Good evening and calling the meeting to order. Welcome to the West Hartford Public Schools Regular Board of Education meeting. It is Tuesday, October the 17th. Charlotte, may you please call the roll? Ms. Fernandez? Present. Mr. Goldman? Present. Dr. Harris? Here. Dr. Kamoff? Here. Mrs. Nazarella? Present. Dr. Steinberg? Here. Dr. Thomas Farquharson? Here. Student Representative Liam Wright? Here. Student Representative Chris Ramal? I believe he's on his way. Thank you. Liam, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> we do not have a revision to the agenda order. Before we proceed with the agenda, I do want to share a comment. And that is that we know that our role as Board of Ed members is to come here, we have three primary roles. We often speak of this, that is to issue policy, to appoint our superintendent, and to issue the budget. We also know that what oversees all of that as well is ensuring the safety of all of our young people and prioritizing that. And as much as we love our town, we know that our town is not immune from experiencing what is happening outside of our town and outside of our country. And we know that we're all seeing a lot, hearing a lot, and feeling a lot. And as board members, that is the common thread that we have being board members, but also the common thread that all of us have is that we're parents and that we have loved ones. And what we see, unfortunately, does not take away from that. When we come before you, we are reminded of our primary charge, but we cannot take away from the fact that we're human and that we feel. And recognizing that, we know that our young people are human and they're feeling and they're seeing. And they're seeing a lot and hurting a lot. And we feel that. And so with that, going to ask for us to have a moment of silence, but what is unfortunate is even with the moment of silence, it does not take away from the reality of what is happening, but it is acknowledging what is happening and that we're all feeling. Will you please have a moment of silence? Thank you. And with that, I'm going to ask for our superintendent to please share what has been underway in response to what has been happening. Thank you, Lorna. So as a school district, we, we continue to have dramatic concerns for all the victims and the ongoing violence that we see playing out in our world and in the Middle East. And obviously, you know, these hostilities are marked by civilian casualties and the impact of that news on our community has been one of shock, has been one of grief, often anxiety, fear, and anger. And our role first and foremost in education is ensuring the safety and the well-being of our students to include their emotional well-being. And we are aware that we have students in our schools with close connections to Israel we have students in our schools with close connections to Gaza and other parts of the world. And we have a duty to provide supports to students who may be carrying that anxiety, that fear, that sadness, and any other emotions who need assistance processing those emotions. We have a responsibility to provide for a learning environment that is free of discrimination, that guards against anti-Semitism, that guards against Islamophobia. So our principals have messaged internally with staff to ensure that they're alert to student reactions. They refer students to our counselors, to our clinical staff, and that we ensure that they're receiving the appropriate guidance, the appropriate support from our professionals. Our secondary principals, middle school and high school, they've received resources and they conducted 
age-appropriate activities to help acknowledge the loss of lives and to signal the opportunity to our students that there is room for discussion um, and there's direction for supports. Um, all principals have sent home messaging to highlight the resources that are available to our families um, that would enable conversations with children. And a district message followed at the end of last week to ensure that those resources were seen by all. Um, I am meeting with principals this week um, to have an ongoing conversation and discuss the continued needs that we see within our school community for our students, um, for their staff, and certainly what they're hearing from families. I've personally heard through principals of parents and teachers that have close friends or family that are sheltering. Um, the conflict in the region is far from over and we'll continue to discuss the needs of our school communities to fulfill our roles, as I said, to keep children safe and to support our teachers and our families. Thank you. And so with that, we will proceed with following the agenda and go to public communications. This is where we're able to hear from you, your thoughts, your questions, your suggestions, your concerns. Each individual is allowed three minutes to speak. We ask when you come to the podium to please share your name and the town that you reside in. Please also be mindful of Charlotte, who will hold up a yellow card when you have one minute remaining in your time. And when your time has expired, you will see a red card. We ask for you please to respectfully take your seat at that time. Please know that it's policy that we do not respond or comment to comments as they're being made. However, we are attentively listening to what is being shared. With this being the second meeting of the month, we are receiving comments from those speaking on agenda items. And for this evening, the agenda items include accepting new policies, revision to the 2023-2024 school calendar, high school graduation date, revision to the 2023-2024 Board of Ed calendar, SAT results, and financial report. So again, we are receiving comments on noted agenda items. We have a list here. I'll begin by calling those who've stated their name on the list, starting with Mark Walsh. Mark Walls, 33 Huckleberry Lane. I hope we stay committed to keeping our kids safe physically in school. With that, 5720, search and seizures is wrong on so many levels. You know, just as I wouldn't want police officers who aren't qualified to teach to, to step in as substitutes, I don't expect teachers and administrators to step in as SROs in our schools. We've got in the agenda, we got decisions to search can be made by principals. We have the school superintendent is going to implement drug sniffing dogs, metal detectors as needed, and breathalyzers. Where are the credentials for that? You know, make no mistake, 5720, along with the appointment of Latoya Fernandez, is the first step to eliminate SROs in West Hartford. Now, Latoya, this isn't a personal attack. This is about holding you accountable for your words and actions excuse when you were in San Jose. Excuse me, the public comments are regarding agenda items. Oh, so this please. ties into the agenda, trust me. Let me get going, and, and, and I want my time back. So, listen, she was instrumental in removing SROs. Excuse there. me, excuse What's that? me. You noted that you're speaking on policy 5720. Please continue. Does that tie into, does that tie into eliminating SROs, yes or no? Speak on SROs, please. Thank you. Your time is continuing. I, I, well, let me tell you something. Somebody on the board had been successful in doing that in another place in the country, San Jose, California. Um, some of the quotes from this person was, we must remove officers who have killed or wounded from schools. So if an officer was justified in removing a threat and was cleared to go back to work, they're not allowed to protect students in school. We celebrate the removal of SROs in a school, in a school system. And you know what? I don't know your experience in Hartford or anybody else's experience, but when I grew up, we had officer friendly program. These mentors, the men and women came in, they were wonderful people. We have PAL, Police Athletic League. Right now, tonight, somewhere in Hartford, somebody's being um, 
be uh, somebody's uh, an off-duty cop is is with a child in Hartford. When I responded to false alarms at Hartford High, and there were groups of students outside waiting to go back in when the building was cleared, guess who had the biggest crowd around them? Our school resource officers. So I don't know where this demonization of our police came into play. And Ethan, I'm going to have to tell you, I disagree with you when it comes to defunding the police. That Excuse this isn't a me once again. You need to speak on comments referring to agenda items. Okay. Well, it, it ties in with all this. I don't understand why you don't understand that. Okay, defunding the police. When you get rid of SROs, guess who responds to, to the schools now if there's a threat in there? Police officers. If they're defunded, don't we want them trained and equipped to be able to take out a threat? And let me tell you something. Here's a quote I want you to hear. Let's be honest. It's a slave catching system and slavery still exists. That's what Latoya thinks about police departments and policing in this country. Sir, I've given you three opportunities to continue and remain on task. Well, you know what? You're not good at your job, and I'm very good at getting my point across. You shut me down because you know what? You brought her in. I understand. Excuse me. Thank you so much. All right. The West Hartford Democrats. You are out of order. Thank you so much. Continuing on, next on the list, we have Sarah Wexier. Please pardon if I mispronounced your last name. Oh, I think you forgot to <laughs> Okay. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am here tonight as a member of the Jewish community, as a parent of a West Hartford student, a West Hartford resident, and a teacher in West Hartford Public Schools to talk about the email sent this past Friday from the superintendent and the overall response from our district of the, um, for the events that occurred on October 7th. In the, e in the email sent almost a week after the events in Israel took place, you would have no idea that there was a brutal at terrorist attack in Israel. The shocking level of vagueness and lack of condemnation of Hamas, terrorist, Hamas's terrorist Excuse attack in Israel. Excuse me, Sarah, I do apologize for entering, pardon me. I must honor how we're speaking on agenda items, and pardon me, your comment is not referring to a specific agenda item for this evening. I do apologize. Okay. For does point of order. I'd like to make a motion to allow her to speak. We did it two weeks ago. Can you second it? Second. Pause one moment, please. Thank you. <laughs> so you made a motion. If you can please restate your motion. I'd like to make a motion to allow this woman who's a parent in our school and has a concern which I think is very relevant to things going on, I'd like to allow her to speak. We uh, made the same motion several weeks ago for people to speak off agenda on an issue that was important to parents in our school. And, um, and I very much wanted to hear those people. And I'd very much like to hear this woman tonight as well. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Discussion. I would just say what Gail said is it's an emotional issue. Last month there was an emotional issue. I think we should give her the chance to speak. I will say that, and thank you, ma'am, for being patient uh, and receiving the motion. And with respect to you patiently being here and speaking, I can see why the motion was made. However, I do encourage for us to do things in order and for it to have happened sooner than later in terms of making the motion. However, we're just having discussion. And so I receive the motion and the second, respectfully so. Any other comments? All can, of- Can I just, it was, I didn't anticipate anybody speaking, so in fairness, if I thought about it, I would have come to you sooner, but it didn't even, you know, I appreciate you coming because so. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And we started off by talking we're humans, so want to acknowledge that we're humans. So all of those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support. Um, 
So if you read the email sent almost a week after the events in Israel took place, you would have no idea that there was a brutal terrorist attack in Israel. The shocking level of vagueness and lack of condemnation of Hamas's terrorist attack in Israel in the email comes off as indifference at best. The quiet tone of the district's response has sent a message of unimportance of this issue to fam students, families, and community members. There is no uh, equivo uh, equivocation about it. This was a terrorist attack, recognized as a terrorist attack not only by the White House, but the countries across the globe. How can my daughter feel that she is in a safe and welcoming school when our district, which has a history of making statements about current events like supporting Ukraine, suddenly describe, decide that a terrorist attack on Jewish people is the appropriate time to be silent? How can my daughter and other others in the community feel support, it, support when the district is essentially si silent on a terrorist attack that has had a direct impact on her and many of the district's students? For a district that prides itself on diversity, equity, and inclusivity, how can we stay silent? We can do better. I realize that making comments about what has happened in the aftermath of a terrorist attack can be easily misconstrued as anti-Israel or anti-Palestinian. Speaking out against Hamas does not make anybody pro or anti-Israel or pro or anti-Palestinian. It makes us humans acknowledging atrocities that have occurred. We should be mournful and outraged by all the civilian and innocent deaths. We should say that we don't stand for hate. Staying silent um, hurts this community and it hurts the students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Anita. Anita Kellyan. So I'm here to speak about policy 1240. Um, you have received my emails saying that I disagree 100% with the wording. Original wording, the Board of Education and staff of the school district welcome and strongly encourage members of the community and other interested persons. It has now changed to the West Hartford Board of Education encourages visits by citizens, taxpayers, and parents. That's discriminatory. I want to bring to the attention of the board itself what I witnessed, what Gail Harris witnessed, and what you, Lorna Thomas Farquharson, witnessed on September 20th at the policy meeting. Lorna Thomas Farquharson, kudos to you. Kudos to you, and I'm going to state why. At that meeting, which was a board meeting, Andrew Morrow started to run it. He attempted to call the meeting to order at 12.57 p.m. Am I not correct about that? Lorna, you looked at him and you said it's 12.57, but he said it's 1 o'clock. He ignored you, didn't he? And you repeated, it's 1 o'clock. It was only 12.58 at that point. Kudos to you, Lorna Thomas Farquharson. You stood your ground and you repeated and you didn't let him run it till it started at one o'clock. This is the misleading information that I have been getting and that I have been witnessing. Not only that, I want for you to tell the public, both of you, where did Andrew Morrow sit me but in a corner? He sat a parent in a corner at a policy meeting. No Andrew Morrow. You can look up now, Andrew Morrow. I sit at the table. I am a stakeholder as much as you are. This is discrimination and I don't like it. To make matters worse, I asked him to send a copy to all, resid uh, all parents and guardians so you know exactly what the wording of these policies are. Andrew Morrow never responded. I sent a certified mail one week later. No response. Three days later, on a Sunday, I get a letter from an attorney. Paul Weissen is who authorized that attorney letter. Is that how our funds are being used? Parent brings up concerns. And what does a parent get? An attorney letter? Andrew Morrow, if you can answer, answer. I'm not asking for much. I'm a parent. I don't go into corners. I pay your salary. 
you don't pay mine. I want this paradigm to stop, because it's not the first time he's done this to me. Paul Vicinus, as a parent, I ask for you to look into how many times has this parent, uh, paradigm been done. That parent has brought concerns, and an attorney has responded. This, he's the only person who's ever done this to me. And I've dealt with other superintendents and other state agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Addie. Eddie Lorden, West Hartford. I'm here to speak on 1240 as well. The changes proposed in policy 1240, which was put forward by Assistant Superintendent Andrew Morrow. Citizens and taxpayers and parents. Parents whose right it is to visit their child's school are last on a list of three. A list that in its essence requires a person to be all three. This is discrimination. Under FERPA, I can have items added to my children's record. Superintendent Facinus, I want a copy of the original wording of policy 1240 and the change to policy 1240 added to their records. I want a copy of who has voted, because you're voting tonight on this, who voted and how they voted to be added so that my children our children, my husband and mine, they can see exactly how West Hartford Public Schools and the Board of Education of this town viewed their parents. Under this new policy, and it is a new policy, the wording is completely different. My husband and I, who have spent 30 odd years in this town, are excluded and considered undesirable visitors to public school buildings. We are green card holders. We are emigrants who have contributed to our West Hartford community as non-citizens. We have contributed our time, our efforts, our donations, financial donations, but also our tax money, our tax paying. What about the dreamers in this town? What about the work visa holders? What about refugees and asylum seekers? who have children in the school buildings. No provision has been provided in this new policy of 1240 for the public's due process to appeal. Andrew Morrow put forward this discriminatory wording in a policy, yet he ignored my email concerns. A week passed. I had to remind him I sent an email and ask for a status, and he still ignored it. Instead of answering, Andrew Morrow used resources intended for our children's education to engage an attorney to answer on his behalf and WHPS's behalf. Did you know about that? Did you? <coughs> Is it because Andrew Morrow does not even understand the discriminatory wording and his policy that he put forward? Or is Andrew Morrow using an attorney letter to intimidate residents and parents? Because it wouldn't be the first time he's pulled that stunt. I'm asking for a little cop on here. If he puts the policy forward, he should stand behind it and he should answer parents, just like Paul Vicinus does, just like Anne McKernan does. What makes Andrew Morrow better than the rest of us? Excuse me, your time has expired. Nothing. You're nothing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to make a comment on an agenda item or regarding current affairs? I'll ask one more time. We will pause on public communications. Now we will move on to non-staff communications and reports where we will receive our student board representative updates. And we'll start with you, Liam. Uh, hello. Uh, so, a couple of weeks ago, the PSATs were run, and they were run smoothly with no issues, and the same occurred at Conard. Uh, throughout our community lessons that we've had throughout the day, uh, we've been working on, uh, we've been doing work surrounding healthy relationships and identifying what makes a healthy relationship. Our pep rally will be held next Friday, and the following Saturday uh, will be our homecoming dance. Um, our auditions for the show Chicago will be coming up uh, as the show the 
House of Blue Leaves has ended. Uh, Model UN will be going to New York City to meet with leaders from Morocco, Equatorial Guinea, and Ghana. Uh, champion season is upon us for athletics, uh, specifically cross country actually just had their conference championship today, and both Hall's boys and girls teams have achieved second place. Uh, and that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. And I want to give you a, a, um, a two thumbs up for being a great teammate. We know that you reached out to Chris. We had a, a track meet or had an athletic event this evening, so that is what caused him to be tardy. So good looking out for your teammate and stepping in. Thank you for the update regarding Hall, and we'll have updates regarding Conard at another time. Moving on now to unfinished business where we have a motion by Lorna thomas Farkason, Gail Harris, and Renee Kamoff to accept and approve revised and new policies as a second reading. We have a recommendation that the Board of Education accept and approve as a second and final reading the following revised and new policies, which were reviewed by the Board Policy Subcommittee. Referring to Community Relations Series 1000, 1240, Visitors and Observations in the School, 1245, School Volunteers, Student Interns, and Other Non-Employees, 1250, use of school facilities. 1340, prohibition against smoking. And then referring to the student series. 5500, high school graduation requirements. And 5720, search and seizure. Do we have a motion? So moved. A second? Second. Thank you. So again, we'll have a discussion regarding the second reading that is uh, before us. And we thank Dr. Andrew uh, Murrow for being here. And before passing on the baton, as we know from our policy subcommittee, and as we've shared before you all, we have several policies that we review and update. And many of them are to ensure that we are compliant with state and federal statutes. And several of these pertain to that, the ones that have been listed. Again, these were originally presented to us a couple of weeks ago. Ago, and as a first reading, and this is our second reading, which will follow a vote on the policies, but nonetheless, opening up the floor for discussion. Yes, Claire. Um, so if I understand, um, these policy rewrites were based on um, current law changes, and they are, the wording is from Shipman and Goodwin? Correct. Okay. Um, so I do have just minor edits that I for policy 1240 um, in the first line. Um, the word encourages does say that we're not allowing. It says we encourage. So I never read that as anything but we encourage visitors. But I do think that um, we're missing parents slash guardians. Um, so I'd like to add the word guardian after parent. And um, I also read it with and, meaning that you could be any of those things. But if um, it's concerning or people think you have to be a citizen, taxpayer, and or parent, then I would like to change it to and or. Um, I don't know if that changes the meaning too much of it. So my two uh, edits are to change it to and or and then change it to parents slash guardians. Okay. May I offer, so first of all, I want to thank you for um, providing the clarity. The language of the previous policy talks about welcoming and encouraging, and, and the language of the revised policy is also, you know, talking about the encouragement uh, of the board. It's not a prohibition. Um, and. I would just say, you know, I like what you're suggesting, parents slash guardians. That's that's language that we do typically use, and so I apologize that we hadn't caught that. That's easily added. Uh, this is a list of, of anyone and everyone, you know, who is encouraged, citizens, taxpayers, and parents. It is not exclusive. If, it, if you had to be all three, um, it would be preceded by an only. So um, I think just for, you know, for clarity's sake, um, the language you know, adding in the guardians, I, I'll let you guys talk about it. But for me, in terms of what it, in intent and how I've read it, um, I think it reads, um, I, I think the meaning is there and I'm glad that we're having the conversation to clarify the meaning. Um, and for anyone who comes into our schools, you know, there, there's always the idea that we will receive them. We will, um, uh, we will welcome them and, and we will assure that it is not an interruption to our daily business. That's never going to be the case 
when we have parents or guardians coming in for, for visits. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Ethan. Can I just follow up on Claire's point? Because I agree with you. On the other hand, is there any downside to saying and or? Other comments or discussion? Again, we have several policies before us. We're having discussion right now pertaining to one particular one, but any uh, other discussion regarding this one and other policies that are before us? I, Ethan, yes. Yeah, I, I um, hadn't read it, I had read it before, but didn't have an issue. But the issue was raised on, I think, the um, 5720. It occurred to me, and, and again, it's not, I'm not, I don't claim any expertise or knowledge. I would assume you'd have the police involved. I was surprised when I went through it just now. It's all school. You have to clarify that, please, Ethan? Where, where are you meaning we have? 5720. We, we certainly have police involved. I know that, but it doesn't say that, does it? Or did I miss it? Says it says law enforcement. Oh, yeah. did it? Okay. Yeah, right there. Law enforcement. Yeah. All right, let me go back. When there's an issue that, that requires law enforcement involvement. We absolutely have the SRO involved. Well, that's involved. what I assumed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me just go back and read. It. Thank you. Other I believe that's in 2C, Ethan, if you're looking for it. Other questions or discussion, and this is good. This is the time to ask questions and ensure we are on the same page. Any other questions or comments? I'm just, I didn't see anything about, sorry. I, I didn't see anything about SRO officers. Is it in this policy? It's specifically in this policy uh, because it is a general policy for all of Connecticut it's a similar policy for shipment across the board based on Connecticut some schools have SROs some schools don't so it okay. references law enforcement because some schools reply, reply uh, regard uh, actually the state trooper system for their intervention and such and so we keep it as a when required by law when a situation um, escalates to that point or when we have the need for law enforcement environment uh, escalation, we would include it as our SRO. If SROs aren't available, we would just use uh, patrol okay. for that. And SROs are full-time assigned to Correct. The high school, Correct. They're assigned right? to each of our high schools. And has they're an there SRO. every day. They're there every day. And, and Unless within they're off minutes, on training the police or department is available. Correct. Our response probably. time for, for police to any of our schools is under uh, roughly three or four minutes. Okay. And then a part-time SRO in middle schools? Not part-time SROs, uh, community resource officers. Community okay. resource officers, there's three of them as we shared. There's three of them that are shared between the elementary and the middle schools. Okay. And they do the teachings and other intervention pieces as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments regarding the proposed policies? All right, seeing none. We will call, Ethan, I want to make sure you, are you all set? Did you get a chance? Okay, all right. And um, just to be clear, I'll just name each number one and we'll vote on each specific, um, please. Yes, Claire. So do my edits mean we have a third reading of that one policy? I would, I would say no, because it's not a substantive, substantive change that you are proposing. It's more semantics. And again, the tone of what was original is similar to what is proposed now. Got it. Okay. You should clarify, though, ahead of time before you vote what those edits are. Because Certainly there seem to be do. a couple of versions. Do I need to make it as a proposal? So, no. So, thank you. What I'll do is I will reread, re including your suggested edits. Okay. So, what originally was written, again, this is in our booklets on page three, originally what was written was the West Hartford Board of Education the board, encourages visits by citizens, taxpayers, and parents to all school buildings. What is being proposed to add, or rather edit rather, is the following. The West Hartford Board of Education, the board, encourages visits by citizens, taxpayers, and slash or parents or guardians. Pardon me, I'll read that again. 
the West Hartford Board of Education, the board, encourages visits by citizens, taxpayers, and slash or parents or guardians to all school buildings. That is correct to what you were proposing? I was doing parents slash guardians, parents slash not guardians? a next or or. Mm -hmm. okay. I would just do and slash or parents slash guardians. Okay, duly noted, we'll rest. What? No, I was just giving you words, Beth, but I will stay on it. No, no, you're part of it, please. Put your, your mic, your mic. Put parent and guardian as the first one, and then it sounds better than, because you got a lot of and or slash parent slash guardian. So you're yep. proposing saying encourage visits by parents slash guardians, citizens, and taxpayers. And or. And or. And or, and or taxpayers. Okay. It's scary if I'm giving wordsmith advice. <laughs> that makes sense. So. so read it in its entirety, please. The West, sorry, the West Hartford Board of Education, the board, encourages visits by parents slash guardians, comma, citizens, comma, taxpayers, and, I'm sorry, and or taxpayers. So the and or goes right before taxpayers. All right, okay, one final time. <laughs> the West Hartford Board of Education, the board, encourages visits by parents slash guardians, citizens, and or taxpayers to all school buildings. All right, all in agreement, okay. So recognizing that note, though that noted edit, any other discussion? So beginning with policy 1240, all of those in favor, this is the visitors and observations in the school. All of those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions, the ayes have it. Referring to 1245, school volunteers, student interns, and other non-employees. All of those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Referring to 1250, use of school facilities. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Referring to 1340, prohibition against smoking. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Referring to 5500, high school graduation requirements. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. And lastly, referring to 5720, search and seizure. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. The policies have passed. Thank you all so much for robust discussion. Dr. Murrow, thank you so much. Moving on now to new business, where we have revising the 2023-2024 school calendar by canceling school on April the 2nd, 2024, in the interest of student safety. We have a recommendation that the Board of Education approve the recommendation that on Tuesday, April the 2nd, 2024, school will not be in session due to Connecticut's primary elections. Is there a motion? I so move. move. Thank you, Claire. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Renee. Discussion and passing it to Dr. Murr. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Vicenas. Thank you very much. So um, we had been contacted. Uh, about the primaries which were previously scheduled on the date of April 30th and it was going to be brought to the attention to the board um, about a potential cancellation for April the 30th and then um, we saw that there was action within the Connecticut General Assembly to pass a bill basically to have an earlier primary date here in Connecticut is April the 2nd. So we held off on that but essentially um, with the primary, and it's a presidential primary being held on April 2nd, which is scheduled as a school day, and with the fact that um, our school buildings, seven our school, of our school buildings, two of our elementaries, all three of our middle schools, and both of our high schools are used as polling locations, um, and there is, there is a definitive need to have the public um, come in and exercise their, you know, their rights to, uh, to vote. And given that we, you know, it would be uh, not only uh, complicated, but potentially a safety concern to be trying to run school at the same time as running the voting. And often we hear, even when school is not in session, 
we hear that the parking situations and the access to the voting is a significant challenge. Uh, the thought is to cancel that day of school. And like with any other cancellation of school, we would append a day on to the end of the school year, as we will continue to do this winter with the potential for weather closings um, when there is a school cancellation. So uh, we will still go the full 182 days, but we would simply uh, cancel school on April the 2nd. Thank you. Discussion, yes, Gail. So, Paul, I'm just wondering, had April 30th already been canceled or it had not been? No, I, I bring that up just in case anyone had the April 30th date in their mind. Um, what had happened was over the summer, um, I had been contacted by the registrar uh, or by the registrar of voters to ask that we bring this topic to the Board of Education. Um, and I didn't know if any of you had heard uh, that there might be a conversation about, about school on April the 30th. That April 30th date was changed to April the 2nd. So this is the only change that is necessary. Um, but it is a change from uh, in the past when we have had primaries and we've had cancellations in the past due to this. They have always been later in the year. It's just sort of noting that Connecticut has moved up uh, the primary to earlier in the month of April. Can I, just, can I just follow up with one thing? So in past years, we have canceled school on primary days? In when we've had significant elections such as presidential elections and most recently as we've had, I would say, um, you know, a greater focus on security within our schools and and uh, I think a, a lot of the emergence of, uh, you know, sometimes we see violence. It's, it's sort of a question of if we're going to have school in session, let's have school. Let's have a, let's have our normal operation. If if the schools are going to be. Um, uh, going to be utilized for the public and there's no control over who might show up whether from town or not from town or what have you then let's not have uh, students be there yes Ethan so to clarify April 30th on the calendar right now is a school day already yep I apologize for even mentioning April 30th <laughs> no 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 it's no I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm poking at myself um, April 2nd um, is the day in question it's a school day and uh, just our primary has been moved up from the 30th to the second other questions or discussion points with the motion on the floor uh, to proposing to cancel school on April the 2nd 2024 all of those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed abstentions the ayes have it thank you now moving on to setting the date for the June 2024 high school graduation. The recommendation is that the Board of Education vote to set the date for this year's high school graduation on Tuesday, June 11th, 2024. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Renee. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ari. Discussion. Liam, I have to say for a second, I was looking your way for you to vote, but that's all I Thank you so much. So discussion. Again, the high school graduation date has been proposed for June 11th, 2024. So I can give very short comments. Please do. Um, go ahead. Sure. That is the day under discussion. I will need to do a quick so concert. There's a Jewish holiday that starts on um, two. I just want to be sure. Yeah, there's a Jewish holiday that starts on the evening of June 11th. I don't know what time graduation is. So, graduation um, is typically held, I want to say, uh, in the afternoon. Is it 4 o'clock? 4 o'clock. 5 o'clock? Five o'clock, um, and what runs for an hour, hour and a half at best? Is that a? An hour and a half. Okay. I don't. Usually, Jewish holidays don't start. Right. Usually, Jewish holidays start at sundown. At sundown. And I, in June, sundown is fairly late, but um, I don't know the exact time. But people that you know would observe that holiday would not be able to come to graduation. So. But it might, it might just be something to look at. I mean, if graduation were to start late, I mean, early enough, or it may, 
it may not hit sort of sundown when, when the holiday would start. Okay. Um, do you want to? If I yeah, first thank you for 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 raising raising this and respecting certainly all all um, religious holidays and recognizing with graduation being five and um, yes sun um, set in the summer months happening later in June it's typically around seven or eight but nonetheless respecting that the start of the holiday would be at sundown and so uh, yes let us table we will table the vote thank you once again for bringing that up um, and it says it's eight. It's eight, yeah, eight thirty on June eleventh. But that is a Tuesday. The old last day of school was the Monday, correct? So, yes. Yeah, so typically, we do often try to avoid having uh, graduation on a Monday. Uh, we try to have it during a weekday, just based on uh, often there's family who's traveling in, and I think it's it's really out of a preference to you know help support their travel plans. Uh, traveling can sometimes be more expensive. It's also often prudent to have a little bit of time, space, and distance from the weekend um, just for safety of students and such. And we'd have to count on a snow day to move it to Wednesday. And Which is not outside of what we've done, but, we, you know, I don't, I don't know if we want to look into that Wednesday's a little bit more and have some... Can I say something? We have, we have time if we want to if we want to spend a little bit more of thought time and, and look at this conflict so that we don't we don't have to rush to a decision that we may regret right. we can it might not be a conflict and I could look at the time when I get home what time it actually starts it, it may actually not be a conflict because it may start late enough but yeah and and I certainly don't want to to have a hasteful decision uh, that would impact a significant part of our community so we can easily bring this back to a later vote um, we ha we have time to do so duly noted and let's 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 do that we will table thank you for bringing uh, this up and we will uh, revisit this so we can make a sound decision thank you thank you so much with that we'll move on to C revising the 2023 2024 Board of Education calendar by moving the April 2nd 2024 meeting to Thursday April the 4th 2024 due to Connecticut's primary elections the recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the recommendation to move the April 2nd, 2024 meeting to Thursday, April the 4th, 2024, due to Connecticut's primary elections. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Renee. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ethan. Discussion? So I can offer short comments. Um, Obviously, in your board calendar, you know, Tuesday the 2nd uh, was a planned uh, Board of Education meeting. However, this room, Council Chambers, is typically occupied and used not only um, on, a, on, on those election days, but on the days following, for a couple of days following, to be able to, you know, attend to all the various logistics and tabulation of votes. So, so it's really just a question of um, having availability of the room, the availability to... Um, have the sound system in order to project your meeting out into the public. So uh, for those reasons, um, it may be prudent for you to postpone that meeting uh, two days until such time in this room is available. Thank you. Discussion, questions, comments? Seeing none, all of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on now to staff communications and reports. We will now receive our superintendent's report, Mr. Vicinas. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, hey, on one last note, while we're kind of talking about calendar items, um, I thought it opportune to just offer a reminder of our past practice as it relates to calendars, um, the last day of school before the holiday break, before the winter break in December, um, we have traditionally uh, had an abbreviated day. We follow a Wednesday early release on that day. Um, so in looking at the calendar, that is December the 22nd. So as part of my remarks, I just wanted to offer that reminder now since we're kind of on the topic. But certainly I'll be sharing that with you again as the board and more importantly with our public um, closer to that time. All right. Um, 
other business, I really just have some celebrations that, uh, that I wanted to share with you to uh, let you know about things that are happening out in our schools and our communities. Um, the first of which uh, goes back to uh, late September, on September 28th each year, uh, our Wilkett Elementary School participates in what's known as National Neighborhood Day, um, which itself is a day to celebrate and uh, build and sustain neighborhood relationships to provide the foundation for civic action and building strong, caring, and effective communities. So this year, Wilkett Elementary welcomed Stephen Hernandez, who is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Senior Opportunities, and Equity as part of the General Assembly. Mr. Hernandez connected classroom read-alouds and an accompanying lesson of the book Just Ask to all grade four classrooms with the purpose of expanding upon and deepening what it means to be a positive and inclusive neighbor who strengthens our community. Um, other good news, on Wednesday, October the 4th, I had the privilege to be there myself. Our physical education and health department hosted its annual elementary fun run with nearly 250 third, fourth, and fifth graders uh, practicing their endurance and their speed while running the mile. Um, and that was, that was quite a spectacle and quite a fun event. Um, the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools has recently made numerous awards uh, for a variety of projects in support of our schools, our teachers, and our students. Um, in total, this year, the Foundation has provided over $70,000 in grant funding, and we have immense gratitude for the work that they do uh, for more than a quarter of a century, uh, providing supports to enhance and enliven the classroom experience of all of our students. I'm very pleased to announce Conard High School art teachers Jessica Fallis and Sarah Reagan are the recipients of the Connecticut Art Education Association National Art Honor Society Award. That's a mouthful. Um, it's a very prestigious recognition for outstanding achievement, contributions, and service within the field of art education. And lastly, uh, Jackie Coricelli, a computer science teacher and curriculum specialist uh, in our high schools, was selected among 300 applicants to serve on a panel of expert teacher and industry leaders to reimagine computer science pathways in high school and beyond. Um, this effort that she's a part of um, is undertaken by the Computer Science Teachers Association and funded through a National Science Foundation grant. And that is my update, and welcome for any questions or discussion. Thank you so much. Questions or comments regarding what we've received from our superintendent? Thank you so much. Moving on now to staff reports and board discussions, where we will receive the 2023 school day SAT reports. And we welcome Ms. Ann McKernan and Ms. Eileen Eustace, who are here to report. Ooh, I'm not having deja vu. Good, good, good. All right. Wow, that's interesting. It's usually... Wow. This table must have moved back this way. I'm glad we're too tall. I think we're going to do a couple of things together. You sit, you sit and start talking, please. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, I'm glad to be back at the table and my partner Eileen Eustace is with us. All right. Well, good to see you all tonight. And tonight we will be giving the report on the school day SAT that was administered um, last March um, in our schools. And for the first time it was administered digitally. So that was a very big difference. Liam, did you take it last year? Uh, I did. Yes. I thought you would. So please chime in on your experience. Will do. Uh, 
I know being a senior, obviously this is a test that is given to all of our, our juniors. Um, in 2015 and 16, the state of Connecticut, uh, the State Board of Education adopted the well-known SAT as its high school assessment that's required under federal law under the Elementary and uh, Secondary Education Act as reauthorized by uh, Every Child Succeeds in 2015, identified that every state needed to give a high school assessment, one time in high school, in literacy, in mathematics, and in science. So for literacy and mathematics, the state of Connecticut chose the SAT, seeing that the juniors were taking it anyway. It was a good opportunity not to have to take a separate test and then this test. And as an additional benefit, this gave every child in Connecticut a free opportunity to take the SAT, which is normally paid for on a Saturday. So um, Liam is, and my daughter was also one of these students who got to take this, uh, this free version of the SAT. So tonight we are, uh, to, we are going to go through the results of that. Did want to mention that we have a very high participation rate, normally between 96 and 98 percent of our students. There is a state requirement that 95 percent of your students must take the test, so that there's no, there's, you want a high pers uh, participant participation rate to ensure that your results are are very accurate. Certainly if you had a much lower participation rate, maybe they wouldn't be representative of your school. So the state does require for you to meet expectation of 95% or higher. We've met that every year, normally between 97 and 98 is our norm. So that was true last year as well. Um, let me make sure I can... Oh look, everything's working tonight. Amazing. <laughs> Our report tonight will give you some background and context. We'll go through the overall results, the trends we're seeing in literacy and mathematics. We will disaggregate the results um, by some state-defined categories, and we'll talk about next steps. Certainly have time for your questions. Certainly can raise them as we go along or save them to the end, whatever's best for you. Um, okay, I want to make sure I'm on the right side. So. Um, we probably all may have taken the SAT. It's a very well-known test, been around for decades. I certainly took the SAT myself. There are two sections, the literacy section, which has reading, writing, and language, command of evidence, words and context, expression of ideas, and conventions of English, and they assess different skills. For instance, conventions of English is testing editing skills, uh, expression of ideas ex is uh, assessing revision if you can revise uh, writing to improve it. Um, in, uh, in command of evidence, we're looking at a logical thinking, analysis. Um, so there, there's a variety of college level skills that are assessed here. The um, college board did a fairly strong analysis of uh, scores over time that students had received and then how they did in college. And what they did is they set, they looked at the average score a student would have received if they can get a C or higher in a college English class in their first year. And that came to a 480 benchmark. And so that benchmark tells us that uh, through the College Board's analysis, at least 75% uh, of the children who receive that benchmark or higher will likely succeed in a college level English class in their first year. Um, in mathematics, we have four sections, the heart of algebra test linear equations, uh, problem solving and data analysis really looks at quantitative literacy, um, passport to advanced math, you're really getting into much more complex types of equations, and then the additional topics look at geometry and trigonometry concepts that are that are most relevant to college success. And in the same type of analysis, the College Board determined that a 520 score is predictive for 75% of the students to get a C or, or higher in college math. So those benchmarks were made for success in college. And um, I've included a score, what a score report looks like for you. This is what a student would get, and now they're not mailed anymore, of course, they're, everything's digital, so you go to your portal, right? And you see your report with the total score, your national representative rank. Um, it gives, we do not, the Connecticut version does not have the essay in that, so you might see the essay here on the, we do not offer the essay uh, in the school day SAT. 
Then it will break down the scores for you, how you did in math, how you did in terms of your national averages, how you did in uh, evidence-based reading and writing. They don't call it literacy for the SAT. They call it evidence-based reading and writing. Um, then they'll give you the, the subscores. They'll also indicate for you if you have met the benchmark or if you've not. In this particular example, they had, uh, you've met the benchmark was a green check and the, and the have not met the benchmark was a kind of a caution sign. So our results, we have seen some results. This particular slide shows you the average scale score. So I, I should take a moment to talk to you about the scale score. You may have experienced, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm advancing my computer and this computer, so excuse me. Um, there we go. The app, so the students are scored, um, there's a total of 1,600 scale score points on this assessment. Start, the scale ranges from 400 to 1,600. Each section is from 200 to 800. Um, students get a scale score points and they get a national percentile rank as we saw in the previous slide. Um, this part I'm sorry. This particular slide shows our um, performance on the mean scale score results over the last several years. Uh, and what you would see here on this slide is the black line indicates the, where the benchmark is. So you can see West Hartford students score well above the benchmark each year in both mathematics and literacy. The concern we have is we have seen a, dec a decline in the overall mean scale score in literacy. And this is very similar to what we saw in the last presentation that we had for the Smarter Balance scores, that the literacy is struggling to recover, much more so than our math. And as you can see on the math side of this chart, again, West Harvard's always scored well above the, the mean scale score, and West Harvard's well above the benchmark. However, um, in the math, we have seen uh, a drop off after pandemic and then a recovery. And this is something that we've been concerned about in the PSAT, the SAT, and the Smarter Balanced Assessment, as we mentioned in our last presentation. Um, so we're going to see a similar the same themes here. Um, some differences, but some similarities. One of the things, to give you some context of what we're seeing around the state, this particular graph will show you um, if we took the blue bars show the average um, percentage of students who scored at the benchmark from the years 2015 to 19. So that was the period prior to the pandemic. This test started in 2015-16 school year. Um, and then the orange bars show you the average in the two years after. And what we're seeing is that West Hartford in the area of literacy has had a drop that we're concerned with. And that drop is approximately, um, I'm sorry, seven points from the pre-pandemic average. However, to put it in context, we're also seeing the same or worse drop actually in the state. The state has uh, had a 9.6% drop from um, the pre-pandemic average to where they are now. And even our DERG, and we talked about the DERG last time we were here, that is a group of about 20 very similar towns to West Hartford. That have um, that have very high expectations for students, and they too have seen the struggle, and they have experienced about an 8.3 percent drop. So this is a this is a something that is um, a challenge, I think, for everyone, uh, well beyond our borders here. And as I've stated, we have seen it in in the Smarter Balanced, as well as some of the PSAT results and the SAT results. So this is something that we have taken some actions on, I'll talk more about later, and how we can speed this recovery. If we take the same information and we look at math, so we can look at these same three groups over the same period in mathematics, and we're seeing that West Harvard has fared much, oh, I keep advancing the wrong. Yes, why don't you advance that one, and I'll advance this one. All right, thank you. Um, in mathematics, uh, we've actually fared much better. We have had a little bit of a drop off on our pre-pandemic average of about two and a half points, as the state is still seeing a down uh, trend of about seven and the DERG about six and a half. So our news is stronger there in math, and it's, it's interesting to me that the trend is so clear 
um, across multiple tests and across subgroups and across all and across high needs and non-high needs, that the math is more resilient right now um, and that the literacy has been the bigger of the two challenges. All right, I'm moving, are you? Okay, very good. This particular slide shows um, a concern we have with our high needs students. Now, West Hartford's high needs students outperform the state high needs students by quite a bit. This particular chart indicates that um, our performance, in, as indicated by the blue bars, are much above the state's high needs performance. However, our concern is that over the past year, we've had seen a very steep drop here of almost 10 points in our high need students in literacy. Um, we're looking at this trend very carefully to see, you know, what is the particular um, contributing factors. Um, there, there are several that we can we can point to um, that we need to address. Um, but this is a high concern for us. Um, the state saw a decrease of about seven percentage points in this group. Um, from pre-pandemic to post, and we have seen 10. So that is a concern. That's one area we are not um, recovering faster than the state. Um, so this is an area that we have been discussing uh, quite a bit, and we will share with you some of our findings. Um, going on to mathematics, the story, again, it's following the trend we had before, that um, this year's high needs group actually increased their performance and um, is recovering better. There is still, um, and our high need students uh, far exceed the high need students throughout the state. I, for, I failed to mention, just as a reminder, our high need students are students who fall into any one of three categories, that is English learners, special education, and free and reduced lunch. Sorry for that. Seems like the SBAC report was just yesterday, so <laughs> um, I, I should have mentioned that. So one of the things that we're um, seeing that we are concerned with and um, we have asked every principal to look at in their school improvement plans is when we look at uh, chronic absenteeism, um, we're finding a really dramatic difference for our all students group versus our high needs students or even um, our breakdowns in ethnicity. So for example, in the high school, um, Prior to pandemic, our chronic absentee average might have been eight or nine percent. Last year it was 20. That was for all students. That sounds concerning. But for our free and reduced lunch students, it was 32 percent. For our special needs students, it was 39 percent. And for our English language learner students, it was 33. So we're looking at a much higher rate of chronic absenteeism. And to define chronic absenteeism, it means students who are missing more than 10% of the school year. So we're seeing a much higher percentage of kids in those categories. That must not, that cannot help our efforts to educate these students and to improve their skills and their knowledge. So that is something that we have asked every principal to look at in their school improvement plans, efforts to reduce chronic absenteeism, get students back in class, hopefully move towards pre-pandemic levels on chronic absenteeism. I do believe it's, a, it's not the only factor, but I think it's an important factor for us to look at as we tackle this challenge. All right. Moving on to ethnicity, uh, um, students meeting the SAT benchmark by ethnicity. I've broken this chart into the blue bar is students of color performance, the orange bar following the same format we had for the SBAC test it, uh, presentation is an orange bar and the all students is a gray bar. And we see that the gap in literacy has been in the range of 21 to 23 points and it has been a fairly steady um, gap for um, throughout this this band period of 2015-16 through the present. You notice there are some years missing that is because we did not assess in 2019-2020 uh, because of the pandemic and we the assessment results did not count for um, accountability in the 2021. So that's why you, if you see two years missing that is the reason. Um, so, you know, our goal here is always to close this gap, and it is, uh, it has been, last year it was actually on this, 
the lower side at 21.7, but it is not really moving outside of a range of about 21 to 25. Our Asian students do not seem to have been as impacted by some of the pandemic measures. Uh, I did look up their chronic absentee rate just as a comparison to see how do they compare to all, how do they compare to some of these groups I've been sharing with you. And um, our Asian absentee rate was 11.3%, about half of what the all group is and a third of what our high need students are. So that is a factor that we want to continue to look at. How are we messaging to our students about the importance of being in school, being in school on time, and um, staying the whole day in school. Uh, this is the same outcome in mathematics. Um, in mathematics, we had a really nice jump right before the pandemic interruption for our students of color. They had had their highest performance and had narrowed the gap, which had been in the closer to 30 down to 25. We were very excited by that in the 2018-19 school year. Um, the gap is 27 points this year, so it has um, it is not at its highest, but it is not has not continued to narrow. Um, the good news is this group's performance was, uh, it was it was not up, but it was in with, within one point of last year. So again, the math has been more resilient across ethnic groups, across high needs groups, and across the all, where the uh, literacy has had much more of struggles. Moving on to our next steps, one of our biggest focus, and I shared with the PTC last night, is uh, Carrie jo Dr. Carrie Jones and Eileen and I have worked with the department supervisors and the principals to ensure that teachers are meeting as uh, what we call PLCs in our language or professional learning communities, which give them the opportunity to look at student work and uh, look at student data, all types of student outcomes and make decisions in the moment based on what they're seeing. Some of that was interrupted um, in the times we were um, remote or not comfortable meeting face to face. Some of that had been interrupted and our commitment this year is to get those uh, PLCs stronger back in place and stronger than ever before. And I'm, I'm confident that um, this is moving in the right direction. I think it's when teachers are meeting together and looking at student outcomes, looking at student work, that they can make the instructional decisions that will move, um, that will make the greatest difference. For the for the SAT in particular, teachers uh, just just uh, was it last week uh, on October fifth. I'm sorry, the PSAT was administered to our juniors. Correct, you're a senior, right? Uh, juniors and sophomores. Juniors and sophomores, right? And uh, they just had that last week, so those results will be coming in. That, of course, is something that will feed into the SAT in the future. So the teachers will be looking at those score reports as they come in and identifying in their PLCs areas for improvement in, well, identifying areas of weakness and areas of um, opportunity. Um, we are also looking, since literacy has been the, the bigger challenge, that um, literacy is not owned by any one department. Literacy is across all departments. Science has literacy, social studies has literacy, of course English has literacy. So uh, we are doubling our efforts to ensure that literacy skills are embedded throughout the departments and do not exist in one place. And finally, the math department has just completed a strategic curriculum revision this summer that will promote um, student preparation in SAT. So those are the steps that we have immediately identified, um, and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much. Questions, comments regarding what has been shared? Yes, Claire. Um, so I have a few uh, questions. One is um, special ed accommodations. So is, does the IEP list out um, like readers for math for some students or all the accommodations that they would have for the SBA? Uh, the accommodation, yes, we enter all of the accommodations for the, um, for the SAT as we enter in the same system for the SBAC. The SAT has changed its platform. Last year they used a platform called Cambium to deliver the test. This year they have their own. It's actually supposed to be. Did you use the, you took the SAT last year, correct? And um, was, the, was the platform easy to use? Um, I believe so. I mean, it was quite a while ago, but I don't have any memory of it being okay. difficult. 
Thank you. The reason I mention it is because in speaking with the SAT coordinators, we have moved to even a, a more efficient platform that's easier for the students to use through, is it SAT Blue Book? Mm -hmm. Through uh, a software called the SAT Blue Book, which incorporates all of the accommodations. Mm -hmm. and, and you had mentioned that the, the juniors and sophomores do the PSAT? Yes. So, But the, is the seniors taking the SAT a little late for college? Um, application? Well, the seniors take the... The juniors took the SAT last... The, the, okay. I'm so, sorry, this presentation is on the juniors who took the SAT last year. Got it. Because it was in March. So Liam was a junior last year in March and he took it. Um, the seniors are now focused when, if they want to take additional SATs, they take them on the weekends now. Okay. And the one last question. Um, I'm wondering... Um, the, just like the science scores, um, there were years with the pandemic that the kids didn't have some of the testing background. Mm -hmm. um, and then even in our workforce, there's people who don't want to go back to work mm -hmm. and they're refusing to go back into the office. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's some residual um, from the kids and t young teens that... Um, maybe a lack of socialization or a comfort in being at home and and this reluctance um, just like you know some of our colleagues don't want to come back into work um, I'm wondering if there's some lenience from the parents when your kids are home for a whole year you know or that long a time um, making that transition back to why it's important to be at school is a hard transition yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. In fact, um, I cited some chronic absentee statistics for the high school for last year. But in looking at the trend, um, actually last year was better than the, the one year before that. So we are coming back down, but it is still, it is still more than double. The chronic absentee rate is still more than double it was prior to the whole disruption. So we might have seen high school rates at 7 or 8%, and they're at 20 during the height of the pandemic of the year after, they were closer to 25. So we saw, we were seeing, you know, coming back to some norms, but not yet where we need it to be. And as you can imagine, what we messaged during pandemic was stay home. You have a cough, stay home. You have a cold, stay home. You have anything, stay home. And now, of course, our message is completely different. Come in, please come in and, and stay the full day and the importance of being in school. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is, um, this particular class, this, this is Liam's class, this particular class was, were ninth graders when the pandemic hit. So, be, you know, I think that is a pivot. Every year is a pivotal year in one way or another for students, but your first year in high school, you were home and you were learning on a computer. So that was not the most ideal for transitioning to um, the rigors of high school and the expectations of high school. So I, I do think that some of the effects are wearing off. We're seeing the chronic absenteeism coming down. But certainly by that metric alone, we're not there, and we still have a ways to go. Uh, Ethan. Uh, first, a uh, clarification. I'm assuming that the test scores are the, like the first test that the student takes as opposed to the average. I, Correct. Yeah, I know you're speaking. You can you can average SAT scores, but these results are specific to the school day SAT, a singular offering. Yes. Okay. So, Ethan, just to put that in perspective, too, Liam might take two or three Saturday tests on his own if he chose. Um, we don't, none of that is in my presentation. It's just the one day that, that's March what I was SAT. Clarifying, yes. I assume that. Just a pure curiosity. You said you have to have ninety percent. What happens if you don't have ninety percent of the students sign up? It's ninety-five percent, and um, the state the the state has uh, certain accountability measures. They expect you to to hit and you would be there wouldn't be any op, you know the state would notify you that you are not in compliance okay so the question i had was as i looked at the sc scores on page 27 bottom graph and the one that concerned me was the uh, literacy particularly this year from last year mm -hmm. so i don't know if it's a data point but it was a drop of five percent whereas for math it was basically one percent and yeah. I, I, understand, I can see that the, um, both the state and the DIRT, DRB mm -hmm. also went down, but not as much. I know you made a lot of um, 
imaginative or came up with a lot of good programs for math. Is there a concept of looking to do that for literacy? Because it could be a data point, but it concerns me that it's not only is it a 5% drop, but it's a drop below right. where we were before, you know, yeah. or during COVID. Absolutely, it concerns us just as much. Um, we, uh, we've Eileen and I have just as not as re, you know today's meeting we had um, was not our first. In fact, it was in it, 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 we had another meeting today on literacy because we have this concern and we're working with folks to try to uh, we're working with leaders to um, identify what could be at the root of it, what has changed, and what can we put back in place that we may have had when we were seeing some of our best gains were in the year 2018-19, and Paul was in my seat, and I was in Eileen's seat, and we were very much celebrating some of our gains that year, and we have determined you know, some of the efforts we had put together. One of them had been a really strong focus on eight instructional practices that we had done quite a bit of professional development on. And since all the disruption and getting back to normal, um, we need to refocus on what those high leverage strategies were and, and highlight them again and bring them into place. And that's just one factor. Another is we need to get the kids back in school on a regular basis. That is crucial. It's, I don't believe we will make much, it will be hard to make gains if kids are not back at much um, higher levels of attendance. Did you do a statistical on the students with good attendance versus? Well, I mean, just even if you just disaggregate it, it by students who, um, you, you can look through ethnicities, you can th look through all different kinds of groups, and yes, you can, you can then take um, students with certain percentage of, let's say, they are not chronically absent, they have less than 10% absent rate, and look at their scores, we can do that as well. Um, but you know, we, we are just at the beginning of putting a plan together and I'll talk to Paul and Eileen about it, should this be a named focus um, because we're seeing this trend? Is this a two year trend that we can um, turn based on um, some moves we make this year or is it something that we need to name as a focus and change, uh, adapt our direction? My hope is we, we do something because it's concerning. No, we, we are definitely. I'm sure more to you than to me. Yeah, it is something that we, we're talking significantly about. And I think the approach that, that Ann and Eileen have talked about in terms of how we share responsibility, you know, I can go back my history in the district. Um, and I remember some middle school efforts where we, at the time, it was a different state test and it was a different uh, thing we were after with the, I think at the time it was the, it was either the Connecticut academic performance test or something. And it was kind of a, a real shared ownership of um, common skills. You know, when you when you talk about the SAT, you talk about command of evidence. You talk about um, close reading of text, being able to make an argument, being able to you know put forward claims based on your reading and your analysis, and then support those claims with evidence. And being able to look across multiple texts, and that's that's pretty much the the pinnacle skill. Um, that's on the SAT that students are trying to master and demonstrate mastery of. Um, and that's not something that is contained necessarily to just literature. I can do that in a social studies class, um, look across a couple of different, um, you know, whether they're primary source documents or whether they're opinion papers written at different periods along a topic. I can do that in a science class in terms of the investigation of phenomenon and I make a, I, I conduct some experiments, I make some observations, I make a cl claim and then I support it with the evidence. Um, and so it's really uh, in our minds as we're getting back to school, you know, getting unity of effort around, around these things um, in support of, and, and it's looking, it's digging deeper into um, what are some of the other areas because there's significant breakdown. I know um, Ian mentioned the PSATs uh, and I think that was in Liam's report that just happened. Um, students get a very detailed um, report on the PSATs and families need to know this, that you can then go in and you can have customized practice that's available for you based on your performance for your strength, er, you know, identified areas of strength, identify areas for growth. Um, Khan Academy is an online service that's free and available to all students that partnered with the College Board some four or five years ago um, to where you can, you can again have individualized um, 
planning and support to to boost your mastery of concepts and skills on the SAT in SAT fashion. So their, their partnership with the College Board, uh, they've been given access to the blueprints of that test, to the question types. Um, these are some of the tools that we try to leverage, uh, both inside the classroom and with practices at, practice opportunities at home. Okay, thank you. Liam and then Gail. Yes. Uh, I would just also like to add, I feel like another uh, correlation for why the literacy, literacy score may have dropped maybe the fact that it was online. Uh, I know all of our PSATs were on paper, and according to many of my peers, we shared the thought that it was a lot more difficult to read for long periods of time online. Yeah, that that's a great point, Liam. My own daughter who came home just this week said, oh, I have such a headache, because she was used to taking her PSAT on paper. Um, and this year, the PSAT, like the SAT last year, was digital. And I do think the, the longer reading may be a factor. Um, so, so it's something to think about, but good point, thank you. And there is a bit of a redesign for the SAT that our students will experience in the spring where it is shorter. They just experienced that with the current PSAT, um, that it's, it's, it's not as lengthy, the passages are supposed to be shorter, you know, fewer questions. So we'll also see if that potentially has an impact. And as far as some other strategies, we were, I was just in meetings yesterday with some building leaders as well as today where we were talking about some additional strategies, even something as simple as identifying uh, question stems that can be used in any discipline. And therefore, students becoming familiar with the types of questions that are asked. And the more familiar they are, the more comfortable they are, and they, they can better understand what is the question asking so that they can better identify the correct answer? I, I think that your point and, and, and Eileen's point are well taken. The, the passages actually are going to go from 750 words um, online down to 25 to 150 words. So the passages really shrink. And I don't know, obviously, all the decision-making behind this change, but I can only imagine reading online for those long, four or five long passages of, you know, two, three pages versus now you're in a much shorter passages, if that can just help students with their stamina and focus, because it is hard to read online. Um, we're used to jumping around as we read online, you know, the news or, or a popular website, and now we're focused on really learning content. So that is um, a good point. Gail. So um, I just, in kind of building off what Liam just said, last, last time we were here, you presented the um, scores that were, I guess, the state standardized tests. This as smarter balance scores, yes. Yeah, which um, we also saw a dip yeah. in the literacy over the last so many years. Yeah. Is that test also administered online? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. it is is yeah. that new? Because no, that's always been online. It's always been online. So the students are used to it, but even though they're used to it, and you know, Liam can speak to this more than than anybody else accurately, but sustaining a reading focus online like that when that's not normally what you're doing when you're looking at a computer you're usually darting around a lot more to find information and now you can't dart now you have to really just focus line by line to get the content I, you know that i don't know obviously all the research behind going online it's it's more secure it's certainly a lot easier mm -hmm. um there's there are very good reasons to do it but i think that the, um, the student transfer is, is a challenge. And yes, the SBAC has been online its whole history. And now, actually, the SAT is late to this move. And they do have built-in tools. So, right, if you had a paper test, you might underline or highlight and things like that. So they have some built-in tools. And that's something that the more we practice with our students and having them use those tools, that may also help support um, when they're sitting and taking that online test. So I, well, I had actually two more questions, but my first one is about the chronic absenteeism. Um, obviously, if kids aren't in school, I mean, they're not going to learn anything, and if they're not going to learn anything, all these test scores are going to, you know, just sort of right. slowly go downhill. So I, I had a question, which isn't exactly related to what you're talking about, but how are we addressing that, and what can we do to change that? Because to me, that's could potentially be a big part of the problem. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked because, you know, I saw the concern and brought it to Paul and others on the exec team, Eileen, Carrie, everyone. And um, this year I asked the school principals to look at their own individual chronic absentee rates. 
and right into their school development plans when they all submit school development plans with specific goals based on some trends they're seeing that they would like to address. And any school that had chronic absenteeism as a problem um, or they felt was a problem um, wrote it into their plan. And in writing it into your plan means you also have to write action steps to address it. So almost every school has it in their plan. Um, the only schools that did not were, there were a few small elementaries that um, were in a very much, you know, more contained range, maybe 7 or 8 percent or 6 percent. So they said they didn't think they would need to address it. They thought the normal improvement off COVID would get them um, under 5 percent. And so some of these in, uh, include how they're messaging to parents. Um, there's there's different challenges at different ages. For instance, in our younger grades, some of the challenges are in KN1. So, yeah, surprisingly, but KN1 is actually a very high absent rate. In the high school, it, it can be in all different grades, but um, so how are we messaging parents? How are we messaging just students? We actually purchased a... Um, a software program called Logical Attendance. And Eileen is laughing because she's been the queen of logical attendance lately. Um, it's a program that works with our student information system that can automatically generate um, individualized letters for kids when they hit certain benchmarks that the principals can look at and, and they have to approve them, but then send them out to families electronically to say, you know, your child Anne has just hit her 10th absence, we need to have a meeting. So more frequent communication, uh, more focus, more messaging, um, better tracking of the um, of the absences, uh, tools for that. So d all the schools have different plans. Um, they've almost all established um, uh, what are they called? Um, uh, attendance action teams, mm -hmm. so that they'll have perhaps the principal, a social worker. Um, a case manager on the team looking at which students are hitting which benchmarks and what kind of outreach we need to do to the families and the students about coming to school. So I think that, it, I think, and I see you're, you're shaking your head back there too because you're on that team at Smith School. So um, Charlotte is shaking her head because she knows what I'm talking about. We've asked every school to, um, who has this issue to, to form an action team and to, to be on top of it. And Eileen's helping dramatically with some technology resources that will make our communication to families more, I would say, more um, consistent across the district. And um, I, I just wanted to piggyback. I mean, that explanation was outstanding. Um, obviously, this isn't a, a West Hartford specific issue. This is uh, chronic absenteeism is something that's being uh, of great concern across the state and really uh, across the nation. And just to reiterate, uh, I think what was said earlier, because I think visibility for our families and communication remains our number one um, strategy to support this. But we're coming out of a period where we had suspended. You know, we, we always had a policy. As soon as you hit the first, you know, six absences, eight absences, 10 absences, a letter would go home, uh, alerting the family, kind of raising some, making sure that we were in communication. Um, all of that was suspended during COVID. And then coming out of that, it's kind of this, it's kind of this awkward and hard restart because you did. We, we still have um, you know periods where um, you may be you know if you're sick if you test positive you're home five days, so so that's that's five days on your ticket, and it's teasing out and having communications with families in a sensitive way in order to ensure that you know we're not telling them to stay home and then beating them for staying home we're, we're you know it's always it's always sort of trying to uh, to make sure that we're finding that right balance and finding that right communication um, because we're reforming habits perhaps that we kind of lost uh, as a as a community overall in terms in terms of the impact when when it's not there so. and I would add the couple of tech tools, we have a new platform with analytic view as well as with logical attendance. Um, within analytic view, a building administration can set a dashboard so they could actually look at their attendance rate every single day. So that was the other thing too, is to try to provide, you know, make it easier for them to access that information so it really stays at the forefront in terms of what's going on uh, regarding attendance at their with their building. And then the other program with logical attendance, it's relatively easy to run the report so even if you're not sending in some cases you're sending a letter but to look at the chronic app the percentage the chronic absenteeism it's a it's a very quick report that's run that they can then take a look at 
And I can assure you, all of these efforts, they're really, th those two are new. Those We had never had to focus on chronic absenteeism before. And during the pandemic, we weren't about to. It wasn't the right time. But now is the right time to say, let's get this back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. And, you know, the good news was last year was an improvement over the prior, and I'm hoping for even a greater improvement. And I do really strongly believe that our academic outcomes will continue to increase. I mean, it's only logical that the students are with us and we have more time with them. Um, so we will continue to see. But I mean, I'm happy when I asked the principals if this was a concern for them that I think everyone took the concern and the two, one or two who didn't was because, was because they were in a good place. Other qu questions are you, Gail, before anyone else? Sir? Okay, Gail. Did you, yes? Oh, Renee no, and then Gail. Yeah. I'll just go. <laughs> um, so the benchmark scores, those are set by the College Board, right? Mm -hmm. Does the state also have a benchmark that the they're reporting the to? The state adopted the, those benchmarks. Just so the state the approved board, okay. them, yes. And then um, my second question is about the Saturday administration. So are those, um, because research has shown that as students repeat the SAT, they score higher. Are mm -hmm. those scores, I know that's not part of the presentation today, but is that something that you look at Mm -hmm. uh, the score improvements. Yep. We have all the scores. We get all of them on the Saturday, even though we might get a batch of scores. There's only 65 kids across the whole 600 juniors or something. We do get those, and we do put them in our system, and we can look at them um, for different reasons uh, if we if we choose to. So they are available to us, absolutely. Um, we have them loaded in our system, and sometimes I have looked at, you know, what's your greatest improvement point? Um, but because each administration has a different number of children, there's nothing totally compar comparable and some students don't have an opportunity to take as many although one thing we do as a district and I think Eileen might have were you talk about the PSAT mm -hmm. I'll let her talk yeah. about the PSAT I will say too we we're seeing a decline in the number of students that are t um, testing on the weekends I think one is because we have the school day opportunity post-secondary Many schools have gone test optional, but we do still think it's, you know, it's an important measure for a wide variety of reasons, and it actually offers a lot of opportunities. So I think it's also really important that we continue to further educate students on the advantages of, you know, showing improvement and doing well. We do, um, the students will take the PSAT in 10th and 11th grade, and 9th graders will take what's called the PSAT 8-9. It's a bit of a modified version. So we do provide three practice opportunities prior to taking the SAT. Um, but we have been, we actually are going to try to pull some data on the weekend administration because we're just not seeing the numbers um, that we used to see in the past. I, and I do believe one last comment is I believe, and Liam can help me, in ninth grade, uh, I'm sure you did not take the uh, SAT 9. Eight no, nine. I did not. And that is a disadvantage for that this group as well because they had one less practice because they were out that year. And so, um, you know, as I say, every individual grade was impacted slightly differently by that year out, but this particular grade being brand new to high school, first year to take S a PSAT, that certainly was a pivotal time of, of loss. Yeah. All right, last question. Sure. <laughs> um, so I noticed on one of the slides, Anne, that you showed that um, the achievement gap between the students of color and I think just students in general um, in 2016 and 2017 was actually fairly tight, like maybe it was about 10 yeah. or 12 percent, something like that. It had narrowed, yeah. Sorry? Yes, you're right, that yeah. there was a time leading up to about 2018-19 where we're seeing a narrowing, and we we're very encouraged by that, um, especially in mathematics for students of color. We were very encouraged by that narrowing and wanted that continue. Right. So I think I thought I saw it at 2016-2017, and then obviously that number has, you know, right. greatly enlarged itself. So it... it it actually what it did was it, it's kind of gone back to where it was it has not exceeded where it was at its let's say highest gap but it has it has gone back to the higher levels and um, that, you know that's concerning to us because we were so encouraged when we were moving in the right direction and when you're moving in the right direction you're looking at every decision you're making is this one making a difference is this part making a difference and Paul and I were lockstep on that work um, and very encouraged as we saw that and hopefully it would continue. Then we had this disruption. We see these chronic absenteeism um, rates hitting students of 
in in high needs and students of color are higher than than other groups, and so we need to build back, build back stronger. I think our efforts are in the right direction, but it is concerning. The literacy, you know, the literacy is really concerning. We need we need to come up with some really shared strategies that are um, guaranteed across all different areas. So my question, though, is, I mean, and maybe you've answered it, but um, from 2016 to 17 to current, that gap has obviously grown. And I, I mean, are you, do you feel that that's primarily because of chronic absenteeism or is there something else at play there that's I, making that? I would never put it on one factor. I think one of the things we were doing at that time that was that we want to be doing again is that there was a big effort in those years to to challenge all students to take the highest level of a course that um, that they can. So let's say you're a student, you're looking at, should I take honors pre-calculus or should I take just pre-calculus? Should I take AP chemistry or should I just take chemistry? And although we don't want to overburden students ever, we do want them to take the highest level of challenge courses because it usually will bring out your best academic skills. And we believe strongly that students will rise to the level of the classes they're in. And so I think during those years, um, it was very important. That was an effort that we were involved in, and I think it hit. Uh, we we had specific efforts um, with our counseling staff, with our principals, to tap on the shoulder of students, maybe especially students who had been underrepresented in honors class, and say, "Hey, take this class. We th we know you can do it." And I I think that we've just had disruptions to all of our systems in general. And so those systems too. It's not that people completely stopped it, but everything somewhat got interrupted. And I'd like to see and find out to what extent we're, we're doing those things as well. Because certainly when we see our high needs kids, any one of our subgroups, um, we want to make sure that students are taking the highest level of challenge. Again, not to stress them out, but we know that they will be exposed, um, they will continue to be exposed to more and more challenging materials and they will rise to that level. So I think that is a factor. I know, Paul, if you had any other thoughts. Yeah, the only other thing I would say is um, at every instance where I've looked at um, achievement gap among race or ethnicity, race or ethnicity has never been the explaining factor. It has always been the intersectionality with um, high needs. You know, what we what we identify within um, students of students of color, you know, for example, um, we would include um, a significant number of learners. Um, who qualify as English language learners? They haven't. They haven't yet had mastery on the English language, um, and when they're at the high school level, uh, and they're coming over new to the country, um, the SAT is a pretty high bar for them to be able to master. Um, likewise, for students with disabilities, um, if there's intersectionality there, um, and or for um, you know, and or for socio economically disadvantaged, and and consistently in any time where if I disaggregate that as a factor, um, gaps, whatever the other gaps are, whether we're talking about race, ethnicity, whether we're talking about gender, whether we're talking about favorite television shows, the gaps kind of go away um, from the all, all students group and other students. So it's, so it's within that programming that, um, that we know we have to have uh, the greatest amount of focus. And it's that programming, when you think about it, um, the interruptions to schools, it's, it's created an uptick in students who have identified for, um, uh, you know, specialized instruction as part of an IEP. Um, we've we've seen um, an increase in terms of our population growth um, for English language learners and, and others. We we can we've continued to see a shift in our demographics to to have more students uh, being identified um, as socioeconomically disadvantaged. So. So we're growing in density there, and we need, and what we really need to do is continue to have that focus. And it's the focus, you know, that that, that Anne's talked about um, relative to shared ownership over standards, relative to um, you know highly effective instructional strategies, and then relative to the kinds of personalized conversations that you have as you as you really address students and say, I you know I I want you to challenge yourself to the greatest. Um, to the greatest level of your own potential, because you will realize that potential time over time. We've seen that. We've seen that. We tell our we'll tell our AP story in a couple of months, and that story goes back to um, if we just change the structure of 
people's perception of this course offering from something which is only for some, only for some elite to no, you can do this. The numbers demonstrate students do it. Students, students can do it. They are, they are successful. And we need, you know, the interruption has had a real, um, a real slowdown to that. And, and in some regard, you know, kind of a, some reversion back to, to the mean, back to what, where we had been. But um, we will climb out of that. Um, and, and I know that we have uh, a lot of effort going behind it. So. Claire. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, all these systems programs, the reach out to the parents, I think they're all very effective. But at some point, there's the whole child. And that whole child um, wanting to come to school, mm -hmm. um, having that desire, missing it if they're not there, but also having people at school miss them when they don't come. Mm -hmm. And that whole sense of um, going someplace where you feel successful or going someplace where you don't feel like you fit in. Um, and so I'm really happy about the SEL that you have, um, unified sports and theater, and all these things that make them feel like they have a um, something outside of the academics, but there's a role that they, they're important in the school. They have, it's their school. Um, and I think that can help with the chronic app absenteeism because your place is at school mm -hmm. but if at school you're not feeling that great or and it's a lot on teachers because you know as much as there's all that you're juggling knowing your kids you know knowing something personal about them makes that kid want to come yes. and and Anything that a kid could do that makes them a part, a mark that they can make on the school outside of the class or maybe even in the class, a role, then they don't want to miss having that role. I want to I say 100% um, agree with you on that statement. It's, it's, you know, you talk about, just makes, I don't know, makes me happy to hear you saying that because it brings me right back to um, our beginning of the year priorities. We talked about, you know, we talked about you know, moving not just from a welcoming environment to a, to a place of belonging, a place where you do feel, um, and that is born out of relationships, that is born out of, that's also born out of, you know, we've put a big effort and emphasis on student-centered instruction, which gets back to, you know, Ann was talking about real deliberate work that we were, that we were doing. But if, but if my school environment and my experience is, is not one where I'm, you know, necessarily afraid to participate I'm encouraged I'm expected to participate I feel like my voice matters I'm um, I'm engaging in class and I'm having discussions and I'm you know and I'm I'm being heard and other people are responding to what I say and I'm giving response and 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 critique um, agreement disagreement and why to what a classmate is saying and it's being facilitated by a teacher with a with a very rich curriculum with very engaging kind of prompts and problem sets and problem solving activities um, that's a place where I'm excited if I'm going in and I have a limited opportunity to you know to participate and I'm worried about being right or wrong and I and uh, and you know my thinking is never valued. It's it's just the correctness of my answer, um, as opposed to well, well, what led you to that answer? Let's explore. Let's explore your reasoning around that. Because even if my reasoning is flawed, it's it's the exploration of that flaw and the discussion that happens where where the learning happens. And so that's really the, kind of the conditions that we're trying to set. And I think that will help make the difference. But then all of those other pieces that you named, the magic that happens with teachers in terms of the personalization of instruction, getting to know me as a human being, what my likes and dislikes are, and how you're able to kind of cue in on that in a lesson, whether it's you know, about gauging my interests or whether it's just about some reinforcement for me because you know me. Um, you know, that, that's, that's what you know, moves us from good to great when, when you talk about people who really make a difference in the classroom, and we have so many. Thank you for that. Other questions or comments? All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Moving on now to routine matters, where we will receive the financial report 
approval of the financial report for the year ending June 30th, 2023. We have a recommendation that the Board of Education approve the financial report for the year ending June 30th, 2023. Is there a motion? I make the motion. Thank you, Claire. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ethan. Discussion. And we are so glad to have Liz Hewitt with us. Thank you. And I believe the report this evening is coming from you, Ethan. I believe it is. All right. Um, the financial schedule is being presented in the uh, book or in the for the Oh, okay. For, for, the, for, for the full year of fiscal year 23, the fiscal year for the town and school system ending in June. Financial schedules are split into four categories. The first category being the general fund report, which was budgeted for f June fiscal year 23 at $181.2 million. Second category is the state and federal grant funds. At the end of June 23, the school system had $16.9 million in funds entering, I'm sorry, fiscal year 22. Entering the fiscal year of the 16.9, 10.9 was attributable to fiscal year 23. And as been discussed at prior meetings, there's a remaining 5.9 primarily ESSER funds that will be allocated for fiscal year 24, the year that we are currently in. Third category is special funds, which covers nine different unique funds. And then the fourth category is the nutrition service funds, which had a $3.4 million balance at the end of June 2023. Um, in terms of the general fund, um, we had this is for the full year of fiscal year 23. Had a year-to-date expenditures of 181.152, million. It's, the numbers are important because the, the variance is about 35,000. So it was 181 million 152,329 dollars against a budget of 181,187,000. Sorry, 181 million 187,018 which created a favorable balance of 34,689. And as has been discussed before, we need to end each year at budget or more realistically positive. So in terms of the general fund, there's four categories. In the salary group, which accounts for 118.9 million of the budget, there was an overall positive variance of 1.864 million. 1.1 million of that coming from savings and teacher substitutes and teacher assistance. And that was a positive, um, as I said, one, uh, $1. 1.8 million. In the second category of the budget benefits, there was a budget of 30.254 million. The variance here was a negative 62,000, all coming in the Social Security line item. The third category was purchase services, which was 26.1 million. In this category was a negative 1.94 million. Almost two thirds of the variance is attributable to contracted services. Um, and has been discussed throughout the year. It's negative to be high. It was a negative variance because we needed to hire placement services to make up for personnel uh, absences. And then the fourth and final category was supplies and materials. It only accounted for 3.9 million of the budget, but did account for almost 200,000 of savings relative to the budget, all of which all collectively gave us a budget positive variance of 34,689. So, any questions on the general fund? Okay. Okay, any questions, anyone? Well, I got um, three more budgets to go, but that's fine. Oh, okay. Well, no, I just, there was, because that's the major one. Um, in terms of state and federal grants, there was 10.9 million spent in fiscal year 23. As I already noted, there is 5.9 million in the ESSER three funds that will be used in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 24. In terms of special funds, there's nine different funds. Um, and we ended June fiscal year 23 with a budget of 2.1 which is an increase, increase of 185,000 um, for the fiscal year of last year. And then finally, in terms of nutri nutrition services funds, there was a significant increase in the nutrition service fund balance as there was in the prior year. And in fiscal year 23, it went to over 2.5 million at the, I'm sorry, it was 2.5 at the end of June. It is now at 3.4. And there's been designated as of this report 674,000 in terms of planned equipment purchases, and there's more expected to come uh, based upon the balance. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions. It's a lot you gave us. Thank you, Claire. Yes. 
Um, so just uh, the grants funds and the non-public school grants funds have been separated. Um, part of that is we, we um, manage the non-public school funds. Um, and what I thought was, was great in the public school funds, um, we only had 16,900 expire, and that was due to the adult education class that had to be canceled because of lack of enrollment. So we did really well um, not losing any of the grant funds. Um, in the non-public school, there was some loss. The district uh, makes an effort to reach out to all the other schools, lets them know about the funds, but there's not as much control over what is spent. But overall, um, that 16000 was nothing you could do about because of the lack of enrollment, but um, it was a good effort to use all the funds that were available. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan and, and Claire. Any other questions or comments regarding what's been shared with us? Okay, with that being said, and the motion on the floor, all of those in favor of approving the financial report as presented to us, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. Moving on now to approval of the minutes. Seeking a motion that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the regular Board of Education meeting of October the 3rd, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Ari. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Renee. Discussion? All right. All of those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you once again. Do we have any information and reports from board members regarding other committees or organizations? Yes, Claire. Um, so I just attended the WHCI um, board meeting and um, offered to give out a little plug about some things that are going on. Um, October 20th is National Community Media Day. West Hartford Community Interactive is our law our nonprofit local TV station and YouTube channel. It televises the meeting that you're watching right now. Also the, the vigil that was held. Um, there's so many things that they do in the community. Um, they also do concerts and sports. Uh, that channel can be watched on Comcast Cable, Frontier Cable, and also YouTube. But since the start of this school year, the station has telecast live sports, 85 events at Conard. 88 at Hall, and 12 rivalry games. Um, because of this station, we are able to um, watch replays and, and follow a lot of the sports that we wouldn't necessarily be able to. Um, there are some changes in legislature that is, uh, could negatively affect the public television local access. And so um, they're always trying to raise funds, get memberships, and um, fun do fundraiser. Right now there's a 50-50 raffle going on, and five winners will split the jackpot. Um, you can also become a member of the station. It's a tax deduct deductible donation. Um, and also a YouTube membership. So I think it's really important that we have this very active, robust um, media um, company that supports so much in town. And um, i just like to plug them and, and suggest that um, they get more support um, so that we don't ever lose this resource. Thank you, Claire. Any other updates or reports? All right. Regarding other information and discussion pieces, I do want to share, and I have, uh, I am doing so with consent, want to highlight some positive news from one of our members here on the board. And uh, since our last meeting, one of our members um, got married. And so I want to say congratulations to Latoya Fernandez. That's her maiden name, but we'll allow her to share her now married name. My married name? Uh, oh. My married name is Mrs. Latoya Yagalov. All right. Well, thank you, and congratulations to you once again. 
And now moving on to future business, where we have announcements of future meeting dates. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, November the 8th. Again, I'll say that is a Wednesday, November the 8th, 2023, here in room 314 at 7 p.m., followed by Tuesday, November the 21st, 2023, here in room 314 at 7 p.m. Do we have a request for future agenda items? Seeing none, do we have any visitors here that would like to make a comment? Seeing none, we do not have an executive session, therefore seeking a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Ari. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ethan. The meeting adjourned at 9.02.